Hi and welcome to today's episode, which is all about making Veganuary 2023 a little bit easier for you. It's Christmas Eve 22, meaning we're about a week away from the new year, that period of time where people make resolutions and then <laughs> about a week later change everything. This is Shadow, if you haven't met him yet. Um, when I'm cooking, he's not allowed on the counters, but things I'm not doing any cooking today, I'll allow it. I've been thinking back over all of the videos that I've done for the last couple of years, and the idea came to me, perhaps it's worth putting together a collection of videos for people that are thinking about doing Veganuary, or just thinking about adding in some more plant-based foods into their lives. Sat down on my computer, made a little list of some recipes that I think would be nice and interesting. There'll be different skill levels, that kind of thing. And then I thought I'd drink the last of the coffee tequila and have a little chat with you. Cheers. Here's to you, YouTube. I'll compile a playlist for you and put the link in the description of this video. So everything that I've mentioned will be in that playlist for you. I'll kick off the list with the liqueurs. So I made a limoncello and a coffee tequila in the dishwasher. Typically for making liqueurs or flavored spirits, you'd infuse everything in a jar and then leave it for a few weeks. But this took two hours. You just put everything in jars and then run it on the hottest cycle of the dishwasher. <laughs> it's just dangerously tasty. I've got a few more liqueur recipes in mind. So if you hit subscribe and tap the bell icon, you'll get a notification as soon as I do those for you. When I went vegan five years ago, it'll be five years in January, I picked up a load of different meat substitutes just so I could get an idea of what was available. And because I'm a fairly decent cook, it wasn't quite as daunting for me, but I know it can be a little bit, oh, I don't know what to make, what am I gonna eat? I figure a lot of people will be in a similar position. So I thought if I talk you through a few recipes of what you can do with your meat substitutes, maybe things that you haven't necessarily thought of with meat type things, and then we can start building on other vegan dishes as well. A really nice one that's perfect for this time of year was the winter warmer pie, which was leek and vegan meats. So I think there was some vegan chicken in there and some bacon pieces. I'm not gonna say vegan bacon or vegan pork every time because it's just gonna get tired. So if you hear a meat, assume it's vegan. So that pie, I did the meat, some leek, some boiled new potatoes in there as well, and then made a creamy kind of sauce. I topped the pie with polenta, with cheesy polenta, because I love the texture and flavor that it has. You can easily do that with mashed potato on top as well. It's about the same amount of work and time as doing a mashed potato top. It's got more texture to it, which I find really pleasant, and it just works really nicely as a topping. That one then inspired the Mediterranean polenta top pie, and I used some vegan chorizo sausages in there, and then some tomatoes, onions, garlic, that kind of sort of Mediterranean type flavors. And then again, cheesy polenta. I made those ones in some individual little tins. So if I hold my hand up, you can kind of see the size of it. I just thought it'd be nice to just pull the whole thing out the freezer and then it pop it into the air fryer. Or you can do it in the oven, obviously. Um, yeah, just, you know, because otherwise you're having to portion everything up and then it can just be a bit of a faff and things fall apart as you're trying to reheat them. So a little tip for you. Or if you're a fan of the takeaway and you get the foil trays that they usually serve like rice in. I made a cheats bourguignon using beetroot and port instead of a massive amount of red wine. And that had some bacon bits in there along with some mushrooms. It's great to have fresh mushrooms in your fridge but it's worth seeing if you can get hold of some dried mushrooms as well. So I really like using lion's mane because it gives fantastic meaty kind of texture. It also lends itself well to fish as well. So like a tuna salad, that kind of thing. I also made a mushroom stroganoff using a similar technique to the bourguignon, but I just didn't put any meat replacements in that. I put chickpeas in that one as the protein source. But that kind of shows the versatility. I've done a couple of nice, fairly simple stir fry recipes. I made a hot and sour sauce using some grapefruit juice. It was weird, but delicious. <laughs> it was very tangy, and then there's some hotness from a Singaporean lemon chili hot sauce. But you can use any kind of hot sauce in there. And then recently I made another hot and sour stir fry using tamarind paste and gochugang chili paste. Meat substitutes come in such a wide variety of different textures, sizes, formats. It's incredible. A little tip when it comes to using the meat substitutes in something. So for example, the tamarind and gochugang stir fry, it's nice to cook the meat substitute separately just to get a little bit of texture on the outside and then add it into the sauce right at the end. Because if you put it into a wet sauce, it just goes a little bit mushy, doesn't retain much texture. It's worth bearing in mind that because the meat substitutes do have a very different structure to meat, if you make a stew, for example, and you put cubes of seitan in there and cook it for three hours, 
it's going to start getting very, very soft. The things I've found that don't completely disintegrate are these dried vegan pork chop type things. It's textured soy protein. It comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, textures again. I get these from the Chinese supermarket. So if you've got one in your town, pop along and have a look. These ones are kind of pork chop sort of texture and it's completely dry which means they just stay in your cupboard so they don't have to be refrigerated, so they're not taking up any space in your fridge or freezer. So they're really good to have on hand. If you want to put those in a stir fry, just soak them in stock or water, that kind of thing for, you know, 45 minutes-ish thereabouts until they're soft all the way through. Or you can put those, if you're making a stew or anything kind of wet, you know, like in a sauce, you can put those in dry. So I did the slow cooker steak and ale stew and also a chicken cacciatore. So I just put those in the slow cooker, in with all of the veg, liquids, and then just left it for a few hours. Alongside the meat substitutes, we're also now starting to see lots of fish substitutes coming out. You can get salmon even, I've seen. I, I wasn't a fan of salmon before going vegan, so I've not bothered trying any of them because I hate the taste of it, um, but it's available. Um, but I really enjoy the fishless fingers. I think fish sticks in the States, it's your little kind of rectangles that are breaded. I use some of those to make a kedgeri, which is a dish that goes back a couple hundred years or so. It's rice, smoked haddock and hard-boiled eggs. Popped my fish fingers in the air fryer and then chopped them into chunks. And then to replicate that boiled eggs, I used some silken tofu. Silken tofu is another one that can go in the cupboard. It doesn't need to be refrigerated until you've opened it. So it's a really nice cupboard staple to have on hand. To replicate the eggy kind of texture, I just fried off the silken tofu in a dry pan until a lot of the liquid had come off. And it goes sort of a little bit squeaky and bouncy and then sprinkled on some black salt. So black salt or kala namak, it's just instant egg flavor. So it's salt that's got a very high sulfur content. I've had this jar for about four years, I think. So, you know, it's one of those things you buy once, a few quid, and then you've got it for years. It's just really worth having on hand. Check your Indian supermarket for things like this, or eBay, Amazon even. You know, there's lots of online sellers that are doing herbs and spices. Black salt's also really nice if you cut an avocado in half and just sprinkle it on there. And it's a little bit, again, like a hard boiled egg, because that used to be a favorite snack of mine. That technique with the silken tofu also works really well for making a tofu scramble. So it's a bit like scrambled eggs. Just fry it until the liquid comes out. To make the frying process even faster, just stick your whole block of tofu into the freezer. So this is the type that you're after. It comes on the shelf, not in the fridge, in a Tetra pack. What I tend to do is lift these tabs up just because it's going to expand in the freezer. So it'll just have a bit more space to expand without rupturing. I usually have a block or two in the freezer. All you need to do, obviously, is remember to defrost it, but then just take it out of the freezer. Once it's defrosted, drain it and that lifts a lot of the liquid away from it and then put it in your pan and that cuts down the time sort of by 10 minutes ish. I found the silken tofu scramble even nicer than like a normal tofu scramble is. The texture was just much more similar to a scrambled egg. Whereas using like an extra firm tofu or even a firm tofu, the type that's in the fridge, I just find the texture is a little bit chewier. It's nice, it's very tasty, but in terms of replicating eggs, silken tofu is the way to go. I also used that technique to make some cottage cheese, which was just incredible. I used to love eating jacket potatoes with cottage cheese and baked beans. Sounds minging, but I love it because you've got the kind of sweetness from the baked beans and then you've got that tanginess from the cottage cheese. In the hopefully not too distant future, I'm going to do a video for you to make egg salad, like egg mayonnaise. So I'll do that same frying pan texture, black salt, bind everything together with some vegan mayonnaise. Moved on to Amarula. My friend bought me a bottle for my birthday. It's quite tasty. <laughs> Lots of the brands like Bailey's, Amarula, they're doing vegan versions as well. So it's definitely worth having a look. When I did the vegan mayo video, I used it to make potato salad and then also like a tuna salad. So that used chickpeas and some of the lion's mane mushrooms that I mentioned earlier. Worked really nicely. The texture was spot on. And then a bit of seaweed to get that kind of tuna flavor. I also made a soda bread in that video. I've done a few soda breads because they're just lovely and quick. You don't need to mess around with rising and like, tons of kneading and proving and all that kind of stuff. The salads and the breads make for a great lunch, you know, if you don't want to have such a substantial meal, especially when paired with some of the pâtés that I've done. I did the chicken liver pâté. I was amazed at how well it came out. <laughs> the flavour was spot on. A touch of tequila in there for some gamey flavour. 
and then used red lentils for the main substrate. I also made a smoked mushroom, walnut and whiskey pate, which was just stunning. That made a really nice lunch or a kind of late evening supper, that kind of thing because it fills you up, but doesn't leave you absolutely stuffed. I also made a pumpkin pate, some nuts in there, some barberries, just had a really wonderful texture. There's another video where I'll show you how to make tapenades, which is like um, a paste. <laughs> That's not the sexiest way of putting it. So you blend down olives. So I did a green olive and a black olive, two separate ones, but they just got a really wonderful flavor. And the black tapenade especially, you can add that to stews, chili, bolognese, that kind of thing, it just deepens the flavor with lots of umami deliciousness. In terms of breakfast food as a vegan, I'm not the greatest breakfast eater. I have to force myself to eat. <laughs> Otherwise I don't eat till 5 p.m. and then I don't stop eating until I go to bed. Um, but I make myself eat like a bowl of yogurt with some granola on top. And that's just, it's just about as much as I can cope with first thing. Unless I'm having, you know, I'm out and about and I'm having a full English type of breakfast, but that's a rarity. <laughs> I've done two granola videos so far. The first one had two options. There was maple pecan. That was kind of a classic one with lots of oil and maple syrup, that kind of thing. And then the second one I did, it was chocolate, ginger, and orange. Now that one used aquafaba, which is the water you get in a chickpea, you know, in a can of chickpeas, that kind of gloopy sort of water. When you whip that up, that foams, it foams and holds its structure, a bit like when you whip egg whites. But that made a really nice, crunchy, crispy granola that was fat-free. After doing those two, I got a bit intrigued of what else I could use to make granola, because I've used cranberry sauce in the past, mixed it into granola-y type things and baked it, and it worked really well. So it got me thinking, okay, what else can I use? And then I had a protein shake that was very kind of thick and gloopy. Thought, is this gonna work? Tried it and it did. It works really, really well. The protein shake means it's kind of fat-free and sugar-free. The brand I use is puts sweeteners in rather than sugars, but then you've also got lots of protein and lots of nutrients. Obviously it depends on the brand of protein shake that you buy but typically they have lots of added minerals, supplements, that kind of thing in there. Granola is one of those ones that you can get really kind of creative with all the different bits and pieces. So if you're in your supermarket and see a bag of nuts or some dried fruits that you've never tried before, bang them in some granola. If I do any baking, so for example, I did the sweet potato pecan pie recently, all of the extra pastry that I trimmed off that was crispy, I just chucked that in the granola jar. <laughs> Up to this point, the recipes have been fairly easy and straightforward. Cooking's quite subjective though, isn't it? So it's what's easy for one person might not be for somebody else. But I've tried to kind of think what needs, you know, less attention and skills as it were. So I'll move on to some slightly more complex ones. Meat substitutes are fairly pricey, relatively speaking, you know, and it probably puts them in the similar kind of price range to actual meat. So it's always much cheaper to make your own. Popular substitute that's been around for thousands of years is Satan. Not Satan, Satan. So it, if I've remembered correctly, it's Buddhist monks created it and it means um, wheat meat. So what you're doing is taking a bag of flour and then washing starches out of it. You can buy vital wheat gluten, which is basically they've done all of the washing part and left just the gluten and then dried it and powdered it down into a flour. I made a couple of deli meats with that. I did a turkey and a beef. Once you've got your, you know, your big chunk of meat, <laughs> you can then do lots of other things with it. So you can slice it down for sandwiches or cut it into chunks and then put that into things. You can also grate seitan, grates really nicely. I've used that in a bolognese and a chili. You can also use it for things like shepherd's pie. I've done a shepherd's pie video, but I use mushrooms instead of a meat substitute. But you know, seitan would work brilliantly if you want something super quick and nice with a bit of mashed potato on top. A company called Love Seitan sent me a huge box with loads of their products in there. And I used a couple of different ones to make some tarts. I made some little tarts that were cubes of seitan and then bound together in a gram flour batter. They also sent me some kind of sausages. So I sliced those down and used that to make almost a pastry on the outside. And then I did a similar thing inside with gram flour. Gram flour, it becomes almost like an omelet, that sort of texture. So it works really nice as a binder. Using vital wheat gluten to make your seitan means you can really start getting playful and experimental with what you put in there. I've used quinoa in mine, things like mushrooms, onions, celery, that kind of thing in there as well. You're kind of making like a bread, 
that sort of thing. So you just bind everything together. You can use lots of different flavorings in there. So it's easy to make like a turkey flavor, which tastes very different to a beef flavor. So it's super customizable. The only issue for me with the Vital Wheat Gluten is it has a distinctive taste. It's not necessarily unpleasant, but it's there. So that led me to then try out Wash the Flour Seitan or WTF. You make a ball with flour and water. You wanna use bread flour because that's got the higher percentage of gluten. I've seen people make it where they're kneading the dough ball for ages. It's not necessary. Flour will autolyze, which means if you bring everything together in a ball, just leave it for a couple of hours and the gluten develops on its own. So all of that extra working it. I mean, if you've got the time and you enjoy doing it, crack on. But if you, you, know, if you don't, or if you've got any mobility issues in your hands and wrists, bring it together so maybe five ten minutes of kneading and then just cover it in a bowl and the gluten will develop on its own you then put the dough ball into cold water and start squidging it about that releases all the starch and leaves behind just the gluten which is the protein again wash the flour seitan is you know you can make it any kind of flavor that you want to so far i've done steaks ribs chicken i've done like a ham flavored one for a pot au feu, which is like a French soup kind of thing. It's like chunks of vegetable in broth with meat. And then for Christmas last year, I made turkey roulades. So I kind of made the seitan dough, spread it into a single layer. On one of them, I did smoked mushroom pate and some smoked bacon. And then on the other one, a layer of cabbage leaves and then did cranberries, uh, pecans, there was something else in there, but it's gone. And then you roll it up a bit like a Swiss roll and then cut that into slices and makes an incredible roulade, which was perfect for Christmas meal. If you're gluten-free and you're worried, oh, there's nothing that I can eat then, <laughs> don't worry, I've got you. I've made two gluten-free seitans. One of them used things like kidney beans and teff flour. The other one used tofu and psyllium husk. I might be saying ingredients to you that you've never come across before, but don't worry. Like I explain everything in the videos and kind of talk you through where you can get them what they do what the function is so you do have a couple of options you know so don't worry don't be put off or anything i took what i learned from the gluten-free seitan and made some sausages with it so i did kind of chorizo flavored vegan sausages i used rice paper on the outside so it looked like a banger a real vegan crowd pleaser is obviously going to be your burgers so i've made bean burgers before i did some mushroom burgers that we're using some leftovers from some seitan that I made. So I bound together mushrooms, celery, vital wheat gluten, a couple of other bits and pieces. They were glistening and juicy. I recently made the complete vegan protein trio. So I did burgers, meatballs, and koftas. So it was the same mixture using quinoa, tofu, pea protein, that kind of thing. Split the mixture into three and flavored it different ways. So then you've got, I had like, Mediterranean flavors in the meatballs. The burgers was just kind of onions. And then the koftas had lots of sort of Middle Eastern spices in there. So that kind of showed really how versatile you can start with one mixture and get so many different flavors from it. Another brilliant source of vegan protein is tempeh. It's a product made from soybeans. You can use other pulses as well. And then it's bound together using Rhizopus oligosporus, which is a type of mold. It sounds a bit off-putting, I know, but it's a similar vein to kind of camembert. The rind on the outside is mold. I did two recipes of making your own tempeh. One of them used chickpeas as the main substrate, and then the other one used cow peas. So it gives you an idea of you know how versatile it is. And I put different nuts and seeds in there as well. Did them in the instant pot. When you do it normally, if you're in a warm enough house, it takes a couple of weeks for the mold to, to form. But doing it in the instant pot, I think it was ready in maybe less than 30 hours. And the instant pot and the yogurt function uses a tiny amount of electricity because you've got the insulation in the walls of the instant pot so it kind of keeps its own temperature and then just switches on for a short period of time if it needs to just boost the heat up a little bit. Tempeh is another one that's becoming more and more widely available. So in the UK, I buy Plant Power and also Tofu, two brands there that I use. I've done two recipes in the last few months using tempeh as a kind of ingredient. I made some little individual tarts with like a mushroom mixture at the bottom and then put tempeh on the top and I'd mix the tempeh with some ketchup and barbecue sauce just to kind of bind everything together. And it makes a lovely topping for something like that. And then I also used it as a topping for some large mushrooms. So I put loads of garlic butter on the mushroom, mix the tempeh with vegan parmesan, pine nuts, and some sage, I wanna say. And it just makes a really wonderful topping. 
<laughs> so as you cut into it, you've got the kind of slight dense chewiness from the tempeh and then lots of juiciness from the mushroom. And the mushroom itself has got a little bit of a meaty texture. So it's a really, really pleasant meal. There'll be a couple of salads down in the playlist for you as well. So to go with the barbecue pulled jackfruit that I made, I did a rainbow slaw. I did Chinese leaf, which I believe is Napa cabbage in the States. It's that kind of pointed one that they make kimchi with. And I had some carrots in there as well. And then there was grapefruit, lots of delicious, sour, tangy, delicious flavors in there. In the summer, I made a watermelon and vegan feta cheese salad that had cubes of watermelon, vegan feta, cherry tomatoes, cucumber, that kind of thing. And it was very vibrant, fresh and light, perfect for summer eating. I made a kind of Asian flavored crunchy salad recently, spiralized carrots and cucumber. That was with soy sauce, some mirin, sesame oil, sort of Asian delicious, bright flavors. So that went on the side of the herb stuffed tofu that I did. For that, all I did was slice a block of tofu down and then cut slits into it and stuffed it with a herb paste made from coriander, parsley, chili, garlic, olive oil, a bit of lime juice. On the outside of the tofu, I brushed on the glaze that I'd done for the complete proteins. So the things like soy sauce and tamarind. And it just gives a really sort of umami, sticky, delicious coating on the outside and then air fried it. The texture went very bouncy and dense. That was just really amazing in the back teeth, you know, to give that kind of meaty chewiness. Like a chicken breast, it was that kind of, that kind of bite to it. If you love carbs, like I do, I've got a few recipes that'll be right up your street. So I've made two types of gnocchi. I did a tricolor gluten-free gnocchi. One had spinach, one had beetroot, one had tomato. They gave lovely colors, a little bit of flavor as well. I made a roast pepper sauce to go with that batch. Doing that one inspired me to try it with sweet potatoes. The other one used just regular potatoes. And that I made a sauce vierge to go with. That vierge is a fantastic sauce, just, you know, because it's ready very quickly. And it's perfect for pasta, gnocchi, even just tofu. It's just things like tomato, onion, a bit of vermouth I put in there, some capers. Very tangy and flavorful, but minimal effort. I tried out a trend that I saw on YouTube Shorts. I think it had been on TikTok before that. It was assassin spaghetti or spaghetti a la assassina. You make the spaghetti in a frying pan and you make the sauce and the spaghetti in the same pan rather than doing, you know, like a pan of spaghetti and a pan of sauce. You cook it risotto style. So you start off by frying garlic and chili or whatever kind of things you want. Then add the spaghetti, the uncooked spaghetti into the pan. And I'm talking about dry spaghetti, not, not the fridge stuff, just your packet of basic spaghetti. You fry that for a few minutes until it starts going a bit golden in places and then start ladling in some tomato flavored broth. And it was just an incredible meal. <laughs> Although it's a simple dish, it's a little bit more complex because you have to you know, do things in stages, the potential for burning your arms is quite high, but it's so worth it. After doing that one, I then wondered if it'd be possible to do it with soba noodles, like the buckwheat type noodles, and it is. <laughs> so I did the same technique and made a teriyaki sauce, and then again, fried off the noodles and then ladled in like a teriyaki flavored broth into it. Absolutely incredible. And both of those took probably less than half an hour to make. So great midweek one if you come home from work and you're really hungry. The last savory dish I'll mention is the corn chowder that I made. I'd been thinking of ways to kind of minimize the amount of electricity or gas, that kind of thing that's used in cooking. So I did everything in the microwave. I used cauliflower and oat milk to make the chowder. So it gave that lovely creamy, silky, texture that chowder has. And then I popped some frozen corn in there and then also showed you how to make smoky bacon flavored popcorn to pop on top. It was a really delicious dish. Mm, very kind of warming and comforting. There's hopefully some ideas there for you for savory foods, but we also need sweet things, don't we? Because, you know, everyone needs a little bit of sweetness in their life. As I was sitting there, I thought, what's the easiest one of these to make? And I have to say, I think it's the salami, the chocolate salami. All you do is melt down some chocolate I did in the microwave. It took a couple of minutes and then you just mix delicious things in there. So I did some biscuits, like cookies, chunks of cookies. I did crystallized ginger, orange, pretzels, just anything tasty, just bang it in there. Apricots, some dried apricots were in there as well. Mix everything together so it's all bound up in the chocolate and then form it into a shape and let it set. And then you slice off pieces and it's just an incredible treat. You know, like if you don't want to go to the trouble of making a big old dessert, just slices of that with a little drink on the side. Mm, perfect. 
really simple but surprisingly effective one was the chocolate mousses that I made. They use the aquafaba, which is the chickpea liquid I mentioned earlier. You whip that up until it's like a meringue almost. And then I folded in some chocolate melted with avocado and that gave a nice bit of body and some fattiness there. Mix that all together into dishes and then put it in the fridge. Done. <laughs> really, really quick. Very, very tasty. In the summer, I spent a month in the Northeast working on a play and I made some caramel. So it was a little bit of a lengthy process because you have to boil the sugar and butter together for a while. But then I did a few different toppings. The texture of them was amazing. So they make a great little candy if you want something, you know, again, just to go on the side of a coffee or, you know, that kind of thing. If you want a real kind of show stopper of a cake, I did the chocolate porter slash stout cake. So I made a chocolate cake that was really deep and rich in flavors that used a kind of chocolate porter or stout. It's like a dark beer. I cut the cake in half and spread on some hazelnut praline paste. To make that, all you do is boil off some sugar until it goes golden brown, throw in some hazelnuts, and then once everything's set, blitz it into a paste. Put the cake back together and then covered the outside in cream cheese frosting. Oh my, it was ridiculous. I'd veganized someone else's recipe for that one and I massively reduced the sugar content. So the cake itself wasn't too sweet but had lots of deep flavors in there. Then the praline gave it that nuttiness and also some sugar sweetness. And then the cream cheese on top gave it some tang, which it was just, oh, it was heaven. <laughs> if you're looking for a cookie, biscuit, something to dunk in your tea, I've made the peanut butter and jelly cookies. So I made like a peanut cookie that was gluten-free dough and stuffed strawberry jam in the middle. I did the gluten-free chocolate chip cookies that had marshmallow in the middle. So it was kind of nice and chewy and stringy in there. Made a super quick maple pecan cookie that used polenta and ground almonds. The texture on those was just wonderful. Very crunchy and crisp. I'm a big fan of sandwich cookie type things. So a bit like an Oreo cookie, that kind of thing. The first ever video that I made was the jammy custards. In the UK, you can get a cookie, like it's called a jammy dodger. So you've got two cookies and then there's jam in the middle. And then you can also get custard creams, which has got like a layer of custard kind of flavor filling. So I made a hybrid of the two. That inspired me to make like a pumpkin pie flavored cookie. So I did pumpkin filling, a layer of cranberry jam, and then biscuits made with oats to go on the outside. I used that principle to make some ice cream sandwiches. So I made some gluten-free hazelnut cookies to go on the outside. And then in the middle, the ice cream was made from silken tofu, coconut cream, and a jar of marmalade. It was just so good <laughs> and so easy. The sweet potato pecan pie that I mentioned earlier, I made cranberry sauce ice cream to go on the side of that. And that used the similar principle to the marmalade ice cream. It just works really well. Like the pectin in the marmalade or cranberry sauce gives a nice kind of richness there and it doesn't set completely rock hard. The final item that I'll mention is fruit butters. Fruit butter is essentially pureed fruit that you then cook down until it reduces massively. So you end up with maybe a fifth or a quarter of the volume that you started off with. The first fruit butter that I did was apple butter. So I just took apples and there was a bit of brown sugar, some spices in there. I got the technique from the apple butter from this James Beard cookbook. I did the apple butter in the instant pot so that I could film kind of a top-down view so people could see what I was doing. The issue is it spatters up and it hurts <laughs> when you get it in your face and up your arms. And you also have to keep scraping the bottom, otherwise it burns. In the recipe though, he says you can bake it. So I've since switched to doing everything in the oven. All you do is pour the puree into a roasting pan and then slide it into the oven. And because the roasting pan's got much more surface area, it cooks out quicker as well. So it just makes things a bit faster. After doing the apple butter, I made the spiced cherry one to go with the chocolate and chestnut tart. I did a plum and port one that went with a babka, like a chocolate babka. I made an apricot butter to go with some creme brulees and hazelnut twills. And then in the summer, I made apple and rhubarb butter. And then I sandwiched that with some cream cheese frosting and some hazelnut cookies. That's around 50 or so vegan recipes that'll hopefully get you started and give you some ideas. If you've got any questions or you need some advice, send me a note in the comments and I'll do everything I can to answer. If I don't know, I'll do some research and point you in the direction of where you can find a, a better answer than I'm able to give. That brings us to the end of the last video of 2022. So I'm gonna wish you a very happy new year, all the best for 2023, and thank you for being here. Make sure you hit subscribe and tap the bell icon and then head over to this one. <laughs>